exhibition starts here, and I should probably tell you why the Historical Society decided to do this exhibition. What you see in front of you is one of the reasons, because we were given a donation by the son of the man who was in charge of the station the night the saboteurs landed. And um, the jackets and hats you see here belong to two of his uniforms. And the other reason, of course, is that the station is, is back where it was built. The outside has been restored, and the inside, we hope, is in the process of being renovated and restored and may be ready the building may be ready to open as a museum by summer 2015. So because of those two things, Richard Barons, who's the director of the East Hampton Historical Society, thought it would be wonderful to do an exhibition about that, the station and the night that the saboteurs landed near it. We have all this writing, these panels, it's, it's not our preference, but the fact is we, didn't, we only had a limited number of artifacts for the show. And so we had to kind of fill in the backdrop and so uh, with information. And uh, we decided to set it up sort of chronologically. So this section shows when the station was part of the US Life Saving Service, which was uh, institutionalized by the government in the mid-1800s. It grew out of a community effort to save passengers and goods from commercial ships that were taking passengers and goods to New York City from Europe and the South, and they were doing it along this coast. So people in the community would run to the beach as soon as they knew there was a ship in trouble, and they would save whoever they could save, but of course, they wanted to get their hands on the stuff that was on the boat, too, which made sense, the cargo. And eventually, the government started building stations. And as you can see, this map here shows all the places along this coast that they built these stations. And often, the people who would man the stations had fishing or whaling experience, and so they knew the sea very well. And and they were very, uh, very good at that. And this is a painting by Thomas Moran's older brother. And you know about the Moran studio that's being restored. And it, it's a rather romanticized version of uh, a life-saving station employee patrolling the beach in New Jersey with his dog. And you see a couple of ships in the distance. And it shows, you know, they have to patrol for, I think the way it was here was three miles out, three miles back. And after the saboteurs landed, I believe they installed a telephone at the turnaround point so that if they saw something, they could phone back to the station instead of hoofing it back um, from three miles away. This is the second station that was built in Amagansett that used to be on the corner of Bluff Road and Indian Wells Highway. And I think that part of it became La Carubas on Main Street. This shows a ship in trouble. And the way that the Life Saving Service rescued people, if the sea wasn't too rough, was to shoot a projectile from something called a Lyle gun, which was a small cannon. You see it here. They would shoot it into the mast, and then the crew would wrap it around. And they would have what I can only think of as a kind of a zip line <laughs> that they would put the people up on, hanging from something. Um, and in a sort of pair of canvas shorts attached to a life ring. And one by one, they would zip line them in. And sometimes people would jump on top, so that it sometimes had to be more than one at a time. This is a little drill, no, not a drill. This is a demonstration they did, somebody did for a family here, I guess. This is about 1910, so it would have been the life-saving service. And you can see the mother with the two kids and the little kid in the, it was called a breeches buoy rescue. And this is a picture of the station in the distance. It looks tiny, 
which is funny because it's really not that far away. This is Bluff Road here with four, five of the summer cottages that were built there at the end of the 1890s. And that's uh, Clint Edwards, and he's at the Tri Works, which is where they processed whale oil. So it's really, uh, he's probably a little farther away from the cottages than it looks, and which is why the station also looks a little small, because it's at the bottom of a hill. This is just a drill with the breeches buoy. This is the simulated mast here. And it shows, see how small the cannon is. And then this is the, uh, the Edwards crew. I think it's at the Edwards crew in about 1910, to getting ready to roll out the cannon. And this sets the scene for when this happened. The US had been at war for only six months. And um, the Navy was tracking subs, because there were subs in the, ocean, in the water all the time. But the finding station, which became the Marine Museum, had not yet been built. The finding station is on, was on Bluff Road, a little bit, not that far from Atlantic Avenue. But um, it had not yet been built, which is why the Coast Guard didn't know that, in fact, this sub not only was very close, but eventually got stranded on a sandbar not far away. This shows the back of the station in 1937. And then you can't see the station here, but it's, it's after the 1938 hurricane. The station would have been over here in a little bit. And it wasn't damaged by the storm, which is amazing, because one knows how much damage that storm did. And you can see, you know, things are a little wonky. This, this, however, this little watchtower was blown away. <laughs> there are these propaganda posters throughout the exhibition just to show you, to show viewers what the mood of the time was. This is part of the donation from the Barnes family. It's an original menu and, uh, of the food that was served at the station. They drank a lot of coffee. They drank coffee morning, noon, and night, 12 pounds a day. But they were feeding over 100 men. So, it, so for breakfast, they had grapefruit juice, assorted cereals and milk, griddle cakes and syrup, bacon, bread and butter, coffee. For lunch, they might have corn chowder and crackers, meatloaf, no, what does that say? mashed potatoes, buttered wax beans, salad greens, canned peaches, bread and butter, coffee. <laughs> and then dinner, lionized potatoes, boiled franks in tomato sauce, baked beans, celery and pickles, strawberry shortcake with cream, bread and butter, coffee. So that's an example. <laughs> so they ate pretty well, actually. They rotated cooking, and so this is one of the guys uh, at the stove. This was a photograph we got from a book written by Carlton Kelsey. And this shows, here's, this is Warren Barnes, who was called out of retirement to head the station after Pearl Harbor. And uh, these are the guys in, in, uh, who were serving at that time. Now, I think John Cullen, I believe, is here. I think this might be John Cullen. They look pretty relaxed, so I have to believe that this is before that incident. And then this is a wintertime picture, and here they're carrying rifles. Somebody who saw this exhibition told me that these were rifles from the Spanish-American War. I, I don't know, but they're certainly not automatics. And they look sort of serious here, a, li a little grim, so I figure that must be after the incident. This is one of the main artifacts we have, which is the base of a cannon, one of the Lyle guns. And it was, used to be at the Georgica station, and the East, Hamp East Hampton Village donated it to the Historical Society. And then, here we come to, this is a section, a little section here, just to show how here in East Hampton, except for seeing a list of all the people who volunteered, who enlisted with the various services. Everything else was fairly normal. You know, we have the Guildhall Players, the Garden Club Sale, the Eastern Gate Club, 
And you know, this is just a day and a half before the saboteurs landed. Um, and Guildhall painting class, all that kind of thing. This is a nice photograph because it, it was a postcard, actually. It shows what Bluff wrote, what, what Atlantic Avenue rather looked like before it was paved. And it's quite different because somehow when it was paved, it just was straight. Here you see it goes around a little bend and everything. And there you see the station on the right. And here's a photograph from the 1930s. Uh, it looks pretty nifty. Yeah, and the, it had, you know, various buildings were added over time. It was built in 1902, by the way. I probably forgot to mention that. Um, this is an amazing photograph because you see how really there's nothing growing there. I mean, holy cow. Even in 1966, when my father actually bought it from the town and moved it, there was nothing much growing. Now there are trees on the, on the beach, you know, and you can't even, maybe because it's an aerial photograph, you can't really see, you don't have much of a sense of depth here, even though that's obviously a dune. Um, so it just looks flat, and you can see all the way north. So it's kind of cool. This is the little garage. Uh, and I'm not sure what th those other buildings were used for, but I think that's the little watchtower that we saw in that picture that was blown off its little foundation. And that, of course, is Atlantic Avenue. They built the finding station. They had the plans for it in spring 2000, I'm sorry, 1942. But they didn't build it until the fall and it's now the Marine Museum. Here is a train schedule, an original train schedule, and if you look at it from the side, you can see how thick it is. There were a lot of trains going back and forth. This is John Cullen. He was the seaman who was on patrol that night, uh, and he had just set out from the station a little after midnight, I believe, going east, and it just happened that the, the sub had gotten stuck on a sandbar and had landed the people, the uh, four saboteurs in a rubber dinghy. There were four who landed in Amagansett and four in Jacksonville, Florida. They were all part of the same mission, which was called Operation Pastorius, after one of the first German immigrants to Pennsylvania. And, uh, the fact is, it seemed an unlikely prospect that the mission would work. The people who were recruited for this mission had all lived in this country. They were German-Americans. And George Dash, who was the leader of the ones here, had been a waiter in East Hampton as well as South Hampton. He loved this country. He hated the Nazis. He hated the German-American Bund. And there's some reason to believe that he may have decided after he, he went back to Germany after being here and after marrying here, his mother nagged him and said, you know, how can I hold my head up in my neighborhood? Everybody knowing that you're a waiter just is horrible. So he went back and it's possible that after he accepted his place in the mission that he decided he would overturn the mission. Um, even if one can't prove that he, did, he made that decision in Germany, it's very likely that he made it sometime after arriving here, even perhaps when they met uh, John Cullen on the beach. Because the fact is they didn't kill Cullen. And if he had, if he had killed Cullen, if Dash had killed Cullen, even though they didn't have guns, and certainly Cullen didn't have a gun, they could have overpowered him, sent him back to the submarine, which had been their instructions, in fact, and then he would have been killed. If he had killed Cullen and hadn't given up all of his uh, colleagues, then it might have taken everybody a lot longer to find the guys and to find the, the TNT and all of that stuff. And it's conceivable that a lot of damage could have been done. So n nobody much mentions this. And certainly, uh, as we'll see later, the FBI wanted all the credit for itself. J. Edgar Hoover was 
wanted to glorify himself as much as he could, so he certainly wasn't going to give Dash any credit, and nor did he give the Coast Guard any credit. <laughs> This is a picture of a, a lookout tower that apparently all of the stations had, even though this is the only photograph that any of us have, have ever seen. So it, and it's very close to the water, which is kind of weird. And you can see this photograph here was taken from the tower. And you can see a little bit of the station over here. And there's the water right there. And so this is looking east. And then... This is a, a cap that they think uh, George Dash was wearing. They, when they came ashore, they, they had some sort of uniform, which they took off to, and they put on what I imagine they thought would look like casual American clothing. And they buried, the idea was to bury all of these things, TNT, all sorts of incendiaries, in the dunes and then come back for it later. And the Florida crew did the same thing. Um, they had, uh, the goal of the mission was to disable the production of supplies for the allies in the war. So that meant aluminum plants, I think magnesium plants, um, waterways, rail, railways, and also any Jewish owned shops in New York City. This is the train station in Amagansett, the way it was when in the 40s, and it lasted there until the early 60s when it was torn down, unfortunately. It's so cute. And uh, it took the saboteurs a long time to find the station, <laughs> partly because it was uh, foggy, very foggy, and they, they really could not see where they were going, so they were disoriented. And it took them, I think, two hours of wandering around <laughs> before they found the station. So, so that was sort of to, to get you ready for the landing. And then in this little area here, we have, these are some of the more interesting parts, I think, of the exhibition. This is the timeline, first of all. So you can see, uh, you know, in April they started training. I think they trained for three, three weeks. Um, in Brandenburg, Germany. And then the Amagansett crew left on May 28th, and the, the Florida crew left on May 29th. For some reason, George Dash was given the decision of where the thing would land. And he wanted to land in East Hampton, but they got, the, the, the submarine got stuck. And so what, we have two things that are pretty interesting. There's a retired Navy pilot who, um, in his retirement, decided he got, he got a lot of pleasure from translating U-boat captain's logs from German to English. So this is the German version of those two days. And this is the English translation. So I'll just read a tiny bit of it, because it's kind of cool. So he's, so. This is, of course, it is European time, so I'm not going to worry about that. So he dived. They stayed on the bottom until it got dark. Then he talks about, you know, raising the boat from the bottom. Then they're going to run until the boat touches the bottom. And then after they land the rubber dinghy, they'll leave. That's what he thinks. The problem is that, you know, he gets stuck and... Uh, they launch the rubber boat. The rubber boat is back. On the shore, a man came with a light, but was apparently reassured by the people. He calls the saboteurs the people. Meanwhile, the boat has been set higher than intended on the beach by the slight swell. Cannot see anything from land. He tries to come free from the, from the sandbar. No, no, nothing doing. And then he, he tries various ways of getting the sub out of the sand. The, this maneuver is also unsuccessful, so then he tries something else. The fog is lighter. Land comes in sight. I lie about 200 meters from the shore, close to the radio station at Amagansett. Despite the fog, I'm only about one nautical mile to the east of the ordered landing point. And then he says what he sees on, on shore from, from the boat. Um, 
he sees, he hears a dog and so on. He doesn't seem to think that the sound of the motors will be audible on shore, which of course was a mistake. Um, the boat lies with about a 40, de 40 degree list, quite still and dry. Then I, the low water is at 814 hours, 0814. Then I must make a last attempt on the ebb flowing tide. Ebb, sorry, flooding tide. Meanwhile, pumped with compressed air, the boat is prepared for demolition and the crew is ready to disembark. If he couldn't have freed the, the submarine, they would have had to disembark and blow it up. The torpedoes are still in the boat. Then he says the water comes slowly. So now a final attempt. The boat makes a little progress with each swell and is free of the bottom after about four tries. Hurrah, elation in the boat, but now must get away while it is still dark. On land, we are, were apparently not noticed. All the hustle and bustle is not taking place on the coast, but in the background. There was supposed to be a blackout in, in effect at this time, and it is interesting that there were, there were a couple of lights reported in, in a house that was close to the beach, but we're not sure what that house was. The boat was made ready for diving, tank fillings established. That was the utmost and final time for us to get away. Otherwise, we could march along at tomorrow's Flag Day Parade in New York. That was sort of funny. Um, so then, that's, that's that. Then on the other side here, we have the first person account by Warren Barnes, who was called on the phone, you know, and told that he had to get down there to the station. And so he talks about how foggy it is, you know, the various people who turned up and what they, they found. Um, and so that's pr pretty, uh, pretty interesting too. He also, I, I think the Coast Guard found an article of clothing that it kept and tried to have investigated. And Hoover somehow found out about that, and he was very angry. And he had uh, Barnes forced to resign. This is Warren Barnes, and that's a Navy guy, and they're looking at the things on the, that they found buried in the dunes. The idea was that each team would come back and dig up their supplies and blend in, maybe get jobs, and then over a two-year period, try to commit these acts of uh, terrorism. And they were also supposed to rally the support of German Americans. And they hoped, I think Hitler hoped that the German immigrants in the US would become loyal, if they weren't already, to him. And that that would create more uh, terror and stuff like, you know, fear. So here are German cigarettes. Um, Dash was not unintelligent, but he, he just didn't seem to be able to get anything right, which is one reason I think he wanted to scuttle this mission to do something positive and for this country because he, he really liked it here. He was supposed to memorize the formula for activating invisible ink, and he was also supposed to memorize the names and addresses of contacts in this country who were supposed to help them. He couldn't remember. He couldn't remember. So it took the FBI lab a certain amount of time to figure out the formula. And there you see Franz Daniel Pastorius. That's the name of the mission. And you have the names and addresses of some of the people he was supposed to contact. These are some drawings by Ernest Peter Berger, who was his, the guy who agreed with him to scuttle the mission, uh, who had a real grudge against the Nazis. So he, he made drawings of these really simple formulas, apparently, for making you know, homemade bombs. So here you use green peas. <laughs> it's kind of funny. This is the money belt that, he, that Dash was wearing that had, uh, you know, it, I'm not really sure, but I think the total amount of money that was brought over would have been the equivalent today of $2,100,000. So you keep in mind that 
that was supposed to last them two years. I mean, you know, and that in 1942, it was, would have been worth, obviously, much less. These are our bullets and stuff, and these are more, um, these are more incendiary devices here. So they had quite a lot of stuff with them, as you can see. This is a letter from Dash to, to Berger, written from the hotel on June, actually, I think that's June 19th, it says. Dash called the FBI in New York the day after they, the, well, I think when they got off the train, actually. And, um, you know, he, he thought that they would just be elated to find out this information. But in New York, the guy answering the phone said, oh, that's very interesting, you know, see you around, and hung up. And Dash was bewildered by this. So a couple of days later, he took the train to Washington and presented himself at J. Edgar Hoover's office. And there was an agent called Dwayne Trainer, who thought that there might be something in Dash's story. And so over a period of about a week to 10 days, handling Dash very carefully and gently, he tried to get the story out of him because Dash, of course, didn't want to tell everything all at once because he wanted to make a deal. And basically, he and Berger were promised a pardon and they were told that they wouldn't you know, get in trouble and that nothing bad would happen to them. And I think Dash really did think this was his chance to, to do something constructive. And um, he, you know, he didn't bargain on dealing with J. Edgar Hoover and Roosevelt. So this little section just has original newspapers that were donated by the Barnes family that talk, you know, these are front page articles that talk about, this, this is in August. I mean, it all happened pretty fast. The, the saboteurs were all rounded up pretty quickly. And uh, Roosevelt called a military tribunal. And uh, the precedent he had for that was Abraham Lincoln, who apparently used military tribunals in which, as you know, the defendants do not have the right to a trial by jury. So the, the writ of habeas corpus is not available to them. And um, Lincoln used military tribunals to try northern sympathizers of the South. And when he was assassinated, the government used a military tribunal to try all the people they thought had been involved in Lincoln's assassination, including a 42-year-old woman called Mary Surratt, who had nothing to do with the assassination. So, you know, there are drawbacks to uh, military tribunals. The fact is, Rose, because they were, we were at war, Roosevelt probably just wanted to kill these guys, and he had to come up with a legitimate legal precedent, and so that's what he used, this Lincoln era. And then the Lincoln precedent, as well as the precedent for these saboteurs, were in combination used to justify Guantanamo Bay, which, as we all know, is still there. Um, Dash wrote a memoir, and that's his memoir, and it's quite interesting. And uh, then we come to the mug shots and all of that. Uh, I think that the, guy, the two who were more ideological Nazis may actually have been this one, who was Quirin, and I believe, I can't remember now, might have been Curling, might have been that one. I think that one of them at least was in the army, but the rest of these guys had to learn how to shoot guns. I mean, they didn't, they were all civilians, basically. This is the panel about the whole thing I just talked to you about. They, I think the argument was based on the fact that even though they had not committed any acts of treason or terror yet, th they were considered enemy combatants with, who were here with the intent of committing such acts. So that was how they justified 
uh, executing them. All eight were sentenced to be executed, but the sentences of Dash and Berger were commuted to prison, and uh, then they were repatriated to Germany by Truman, actually, and forbidden from ever coming back. Dash spent the rest of his life, and he lived to be 88. He died only in 1992. He spent the rest of his life writing a letter every year to whoever was the president uh, asking for the pardon he had been promised. And of course, he never got it. And the, the rest of his life was made quite miserable because he was considered a traitor. And I think he finally moved to Switzerland because every time he tried to start something new in Germany, some magazine would write an article about the incident and he would be harassed all over again. And what is odd is that I don't think anyone who wrote any of these books ever went there to interview him, which is sort of strange. This is a, the cover of the East Hampton Star two months after the incident. And once again, it's pretty you know, mundane stuff. And then these are transcripts, the, uh, the military tribunal was handed over by the FBI to the army since it was a military thing. And so these are all, all the things, the transcripts of the proceedings, July 10th, 14th, and 15th, 1942, uh, a memo from Roosevelt to the attorney general, Francis Biddle, I think was his name. And, um, so it, it was, all of this, these things can be read. And then over here we have the, the guns that the saboteurs had that they buried. And uh, one of them has the Nazi symbol on it. This is the courtroom. I mean, it's not really, this is just where the secret proceeding went on. That's just a mock firing squad, they were executed not by, by electric chair, not firing squad. And so that's, that sort of is what I was talking about before. And here's a photograph of John Cullen uh, being given a medal. Apparently, he told people that he believed he believed George Dash and two of the others who came up while he was talking to Dash the night that he found them on the beach. He believed their story that they were fishermen. But it was when the fourth one came up and possibly spoke to Dash in German that Cullen uh, realized you know, these were not fishermen. And he ran back to the station and at first the, the guys who were there playing cards didn't really believe him. Uh, and then I think when he, f when he forked over the money that Dash had given him, but at the same time, Dash was, I think if he, he had decided already to scuttle the mission. So he wanted to make it look to the other saboteurs as if he was threatening Cullen and then paying him off. But at the same time, he was, I think what I read of as being the body language, he was trying to get Cullen to recognize his face, to remember his face, because I think he imagined when he was in the newspapers for being a hero, Cullen would be able to say, oh yeah, that's the guy I met on the beach. So he, had, he was treading a very tricky path there, and um, Cullen never considered himself a hero, by the way, which is interesting. The station, of course, once the war was over, it stopped being used. And um, it was uh, you know, decommissioned and all of that. And the town, at first, was going to use it as a fire department exercise. They were going to burn it down. And it takes the town so long to make a decision here that I think Finally, they thought, well, let's sell it. Let's sell some of these buildings we're not going to use anymore. So they sold it for a dollar. And my father bought it from the town in 1966. And we used to have a little uh, uh, joke that he paid 75 cents for the, the big house and 25 cents for the 900 square foot garage. 
um, and move them both up to Bluff Road. It cost $10,000 to move the station and $1,500 to move the little house. And the little house is where I brought up my daughter. Um, and, uh, and of course, now it would cost much more. So this shows the house as it looked when it, the family lived there. This shows the house um, coming up, going up the hill on Atlantic Avenue. It was uh, Robert Kennelly, house movers. It was a house moving family from Southampton. He moved it on a flatbed truck. And here the truck is seen as it's about to turn east into Bluff Road. This, on the other hand, shows the station as it's about to come back down Atlantic Avenue. And this time, it's on, you know, it's on a, a, a machine that has treads like those caterpillar machines and uh, hydraulics. And you can control the level of the house with a remote control. And so Guy Davis, whose family is a house moving family now and who moved the buildings that became Town Hall, you know, was, it, he looked like a, a boy with a giant toy that he was operating from this remote control like a, you know, a clicker. <laughs> and so that, I love that picture. And here it is, they're about to set it on the side of the road. And this was in 2007, in May. And it stayed on the side of the road for at least two or three years. And finally, the town found the original foundation. They knocked it out, put in a new foundation in exactly the same footprint, and the building was set down where it was built in exactly the same spot. And then Ben Krupinski came to the reenactment we did three years ago. In 2012, that was the first year we did a reenactment of the saboteur landing. He came and he was so inflamed by the story because he hadn't known the history that he donated the restoration of the outside of the building. And at this point, we're hoping, as I said at the beginning, that maybe by next summer, it'll be ready to open as a museum.